Okay, here we are. Um, I am in a tavern here. It's an, you know, kind of an ancient, it's more of a medieval uh, English tavern, but, um, you know, what can we do? It's going to be similar to this one in the tavern that's going to be in the ancient Egyptian book that we're reading right now, uh, Mara, Daughter of the Nile. Okay, so we are on page uh, 124, which is chapter 13, Conversation at an Inn. Remember, this is the Inn of the Falcon. Well, at least for our purposes, we'll pretend it is. And I'm going to read this. It's a long chapter, just one, but I better get started on it, okay? And you know now that um, Mara found a way out through uh, Rashed's gate, the young uh, sentry who kind of likes her. And she made it out, and she's going, she made it out with, to meet Nakonk. They went across the Nile, and they're coming to this tavern here, and they're about to come in. And then you can get a different uh, visual of this tavern in, you know, as the book describes it. All right, so here we go. Chapter 13, Conversation at, a, at an Inn. A burst of noise and golden light flowed out around the bulky figure of a man who blocked the entrance. Hi, it's you, Captain, he cried jovially, stepping back to motion the conch and Mara past him. Come in, come in, and who are you, my dear? Her name is Blue Eye grunted Nakonk before Mara could answer. A friend of our friend. Is he here, Ashor? So we're meeting a new person, Ashor. Let me fix that. Okay. Aye, aye, he's here. The innkeeper closed the door behind them. His broad face wreathed in smiles. He was a hulk of a man, vast of girth and guileless of countenance, dressed in a rumpled shinty and huge copper ear hoops. He pattered ahead of them, his, uh, the earrings bouncing and his paunch preceding him, through a tiny entryway, and into a large square room which was smoky and torch lit and smelled of beer and roasting meat. All around the walls were cubicles divided from each other by shoulder high partitions, but open to the room. And the charcoal fire that blazed in its center in a great pottery pan, in its cubicles kneeling on reed mats before low tables were Ashor's customers, men for the most part, with a scattering of women and an occasional bearded foreigner. They were eating, drinking, gambling noisily at odd and even, or merely talking in low tones over cups of beer or date wine. One group roared drunken approval of the antics of a juggler performing his feats beside their table. At the next, two solemn old men, one fat, one thin, played an absorbed and silent game of hounds and jackals. On the other side of the room, a dancing girl swayed and postured to the jingle of her tambourine and the wail of a blind musician's flute. In the center of all, stirring the contents of a kettle bubbling over the fire pan, stood a tiny dried up woman. From her sash hung a metal hoop strung with ring coins, copper and silver debon. A curious necklace of shells weighted her narrow chest, and she had the brightest, most suspicious eyes Mara had ever seen, her long spoon motionless. She watched the newcomers all the way across the room. My wife, Miftaya, puffed Asher, noting the direction of Mara's glance. A wonderful woman, her hands at the helm here, is it not, Captain? I they'd rob me blind if it were not for her. By the feather, it's true. A babe in innocence, she calls me, trusting anyone, even these rivermen. With a breathy laugh, he dug Nakonk in the ribs, then detoured, uh, detoured around the beribboned dancing girl to head for a table in the farthest corner. As they passed, Mara glanced at the girl, whose languid movements now concealed, now revealed the cubbyhole behind her, in which a scribe sat cross-legged before his inkstand, and in earnest conversation with a shaven-headed priest. At that moment, the scribe looked around, and the firelight fell on his face. It was Sheftu. Mara caught her breath, hesitating, but his eyes 
met hers only an instant. Then they calmly, uh, then they moved calmly back to his writing block. The dancing girl whirled between them again, and Mara walked on. Her cheeks burned as she slipped past the innkeeper into the farthest cubicle and sank to her knees upon the woven mat. He'll be with you when it suits him, Captain, as Shur was saying. I'll fetch date wine to cool your throats. Giving a hitch to his ample shinty, he waddled away, and Nakonk lowered himself beside Mara, settling back on his heels with a grunt. You saw him, did you? Aye, and he saw us, but little sign he gave of it. He's not here to dance attendance on you, little one. He has more on his mind these days than a pair of blue eyes. The blue eyes glared at him, and he chuckled softly, shaking his head. I, I warned you to steer well around him that day on the beetle. If you've run a ground maid, it's no fault of mine. I've done naught of this sort, and the devil with you. Why did that woman out yonder watch me so? You mean Miftaya? Why, it's her business to watch who comes here, and the falcon lends her his eyes for this task. She'd make a fine helmsman. Oh, Asher, set the cups here. I'll pay, I'll play the host. Nakonk took the wine jug from the perspiring innkeeper, who beamed and paddled off again. His earrings bobbing with a broad thumbnail, Nakonk broke the seal, and the sharp fragrance of date wine filled Mara's nostrils. She was watching the amber liquid gurgle into a cup when a shadow fell across the table. Live forever, honored strangers, Sheftu said smoothly. You wish my services, a contract written, perhaps a list of cargo set down accurately? He was leaning in the entrance to their cubicle, his inkstand under one arm. Two reed pins stuck jauntily behind his ear. Even in the long robe and coarse linen headcloth of a scribe, his pose was as easy, his grace as careless as in the court of Hatshepsut. Nay, no contract, rumbled Nakonk, getting to his feet. But this maid here. Ah, a love letter then, guaranteed to thaw the coldest heart. He grinned down at Mara, and her retort died on her lips. As he turned to murmur something to Nakonk, she struggled again, or she struggled to regain her composure. What was it about his smile, its warmth? its sudden intimacy, it rushed to the head like strong wine. She was aware of nothing but him. As he stood there, outlined against the noisy torch-lit room, all day she had nerved herself for this meeting, fearing to find him again the curt and glittering stranger he had been in the lotus garden. Now, all in a moment, her fears had vanished. Here was no gold-hung lord, but her companion of the beetle, warm, teasing, dangerous. Her spirits rose like a sail. With a nod of farewell, Nakonk moved out of the cubicle and across the room toward a group of rivermen gaming in another corner. Sheftu slid in beside Mara. So you accomplished it, he murmured, seating himself cross-legged in the scribe's manner and setting his inkstand on the table. I, but no thanks to you. Was it such a task? Task? Why, at first, I knew not even where to start. A hard master you are, Sashai. Get thee outside the walls, you say, as if it were nothing. Then away you stroll with never a thought about it. He laughed, handing her the cup Nakonk had filled and pouring another for himself. But why should I think of it? I have every confidence, my lotus-eyed one, in your capacity for guile. Not to say chicanery, asked. I'll wager I can learn guile from you. Nay, pull in your claws. Were you not as you are, you'd be no use to me. Mara sipped from her cup, feeling a glow that had nothing to do with the wine. The flutist sweet wail threaded through the jovial uproar of the tavern. Laughter was warm about her. The juggler's ball spun brighter than shooting stars. Even the dreadful message she must deliver slipped 
like a keft, into the farthest outskirts of her mind. You've told me, uh, you've not told me, said Sheftu, what you think of the Inn of the Falcon. Ah, I like it well, save for that old woman with a beady eye out there. Miftaya, nay, but she's worth all the rest put together. A marvel of a woman. So her husband said, remarked Mara skeptically. Sheftu regarded her with amusement. Perhaps it is all in the point of view. I'll admit her virtues would be less apparent to one attempting to snatch a loaf or two from under that beady eye. I'm done with the loaf snatching, but she could watch me no closer were I after her money ring. Well, she has reason. First, you are new here. Second, she is jealous as a she-leopard of every pretty maid who comes anywhere near me. Near you? But I thought, aye, Asher's her husband, but I'm her child, or so she feels. Miftaya was my nurse from infancy. So when he was a little baby, this old woman in the middle of the room took care of him. Sheftu's childhood nurse? The old woman assumed quite a different aspect in Mara's eyes, and her whole idea of the Inn of the Falcon underwent a rapid change. She had thought it a retreat Sheftu had merely chanced upon. Now she realized it must exist solely to serve his purposes. They set it up as a place where he can, uh, you know, work with the others who are trying to overthrow Hatshepsut as a, a place to hide and meet. And Asher, she questioned. He was the head of my father's stables for many years and my first companion. Sheftu was smiling a little, remembering, I, we were fast friends. Many's the time I've ridden between his knees in my father's chariot, holding the reined ends and pretending to drive. When I did learn, it was he who taught me. I can see him now, jouncing about beside me, clutching his wig and yelling, pull left, pull right. Sheftu laughed outright, and Mara smiled, fascinated by this glimpse of a childhood so different from her own. And were you never frightened? she asked him. Not I, but I'll wager Asher was sometimes. We took a spill or two before I learned what I was doing. One of them broke my arm, and I stayed home from school while Miftaya coddled me. School, echoed Mara. Visions of scroll-filled shelves danced through her mind. Did you read the ancient writings? Old tales and poetry? What was it like, your school? He gave her an odd look. Not like other schools, blue-eyed one. I fear I learned more politics than poetry. He hesitated, playing with the amulet on his wrist, then went on. I was educated at the palace nurseries along with a few other noblemen's son. It was there that I met my friend. So young. When he says friend, he's talking about Thutmos. So young, exclaimed Mara. She had supposed Sheftu and the king had met at court as youths near grown. Aye, I was only nine or ten when I first saw him. He was older, of course, but he seemed to take a fancy to me. As for me, I worshipped him. He was, well, you've seen what he's like. I, I have. Mara thought of the caged lion of a man she had met yesterday, restless, brilliant, moody, and tried to imagine him as a princeling. Did the queen keep guards and spies around him even then? Sheftu nodded, turning his wine cup in his hands. She's always feared him. He hesitated as if debating whether to go on, and then added, She tried hard to make a priest of him, as I suppose you know. A priest! He laughed. The temple of Ammon is an excellent place, little one, for burying excess royalty. It would be hard to say how many younger sons of pharaohs have spent their lives tying up offerings and burning incense instead of making things uncomfortable around the palace. However, in this case... There was a tiny pause. He covered it with his most engaging smile and reached for the wine jug. Let me fill your cup, blue-eyed one, and summon the dancing girl. I fear I've bored you. You mean, this is her thinking, you mean you fear you have said too much, thought Mara. 
wondering how to get the rest of the story without appearing to probe for it. Her curiosity was thoroughly aroused. This had all the earmarks of a tale not intended for her ears. Therefore, she had every intention of hearing it. It is the dancing girl who would bore me, says Shai, but I confess I am puzzled by your story. Our friend is certainly no priest now. Nay, he is not, agreed Sheftu blandly. Strange, mur uh, murmured Mara. It is not hard to become a priest, but hard indeed to cease being one. In fact, I know of no way unless a man disgrace his vows in some fashion. There was no disgrace. Mara raised her eyebrows and waited. There was a flicker of wry amusement in Sheftu's eyes, but otherwise he made no acknowledgment of having been neatly trapped. As readily as if it were his own idea, he explained. She, this is Mara getting more information out of Sheftu than Sheftu wants to give. So you're paying attention to that. As readily as, 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 it, as if it were his own idea, he exclaimed. It was a miracle which released him, little one, a holy miracle, clearly the work of Ammon himself. So that was it. In a rush of memory, came back to Mara. There had been a time, some years ago, when the marketplace at Ninfi had been alive with whispers of a miracle. She could recall little knots of people gathered around Theban, Theban sailors and merchants and herself, a ragged child, squirming through their legs in an effort to hear the tale. She had heard it right enough and had noticed that it grew more marvelous with every telling. Half awed and half disbelieving, she had ended by shrugging the whole thing off as being less concerned to her than her empty stomach. Ah, yes, the miracle, she murmured now. Its fame spread even to Menfi. Marvelous are the ways of the gods, said Sheftu piously. Mara smiled. She was beginning to understand, and what she understood delighted her. A truly wonderful thing it must have been, she agreed. It came to pass during a great festival, am I not right? Under the very nose of the queen, with all the populace looking on, the great golden image of Ammon had been borne through the streets, then back again to the temple on the shoulders of the priests, while the incense rose in clouds and the people leaped for joy. Sheftu examined his wine cup with great interest. And then, as the image of the god neared its sanctuary, behold, it turned aside, stopped before the young prince, and led him through the curtains into the holy of holies itself. They say he walked like one spellbound when he came forth, half fainting to tell that Ammon had named him Pharaoh. Was that the way of it, Sashai? Aye, he answered solemnly. The ways of Ammon are mysterious. There was a little pause. And most convenient, added Mara. Okay, do you see what happened? They were in a parade and uh, Thutmose was a priest and then uh, the, the, the statue of Ammon, the great god Ammon, turned and faced him and led him into a sanctuary where he told, uh, where he told uh, Thutmose that he was Pharaoh, that Thutmose was Pharaoh. And Thutmose came out in a daze like he had been uh, hypnotized or something and told everybody that. So, you know, remember had Shepsuits, the Pharaoh, but it's now time for Thutmose to become Pharaoh. Okay, and then she says, and most convenient. Sheftu put down his cup and turned to face her. her uh, his eyes were full of laughter. Can it be your skeptical little one? Surely not. It was a fine miracle and took only a little help from the priests to carry the image. So it wasn't really a miracle. It was something they staged. I thought as much, Mara said to herself, and still you have told me nothing I did not guess already. By the feather. You can't elude the net forever, my wily fish. So after all, she said deliberately, your son of the sun is not but a clever politician. The effect was instantaneous. Sheftu's smile vanished without a trace. Watch thy tongue, girl. He, he is no politician, but a conqueror, fit to rule Egypt and the world. So she frustrated him. But... 
if he relies on mere tricks, listen, my pretty skeptic. Shaftu leaned toward her, his eyes intense, his voice low and rapid. Here it came at last. He had forgotten his caution. Mara tensed herself to listen to every word. Think you the prince was idle those years in the temple? He spent them forging the whole priesthood into his weapon. They are ready to rise today, tomorrow. They need only the signal. As for the miracle, it failed to set him on the throne, but he scarce expected it too. At uh, Hepu Songbi, the high priest, is Hat Shepsut's fool or tool. And besides, it takes more than a miracle to move that woman. Nevertheless, our trick was far from wasted. But if no one believed, the people believed. And they remember. Look around you. Shefty waved a hand toward the crowded room. These are all rebels, loyal to the king. More than that, it forced her high and mightiness to, into the pretense of the regency. She waited a little too long to take Senmut's counsel and arrange for the prince to die of some mysterious ailment. After the miracle, she didn't dare. So now she couldn't kill Utmos because the miracle made the people believe that Utmos was the rightful pharaoh. Instead, she summoned him back to the palace and made him a royal prisoner, too late by Ammon, while she piles honors on that architect and his cutthroats. She fails to notice that many of the younger nobles are growing uneasy over the state of the empire. A slow smile curved Sheftu's mouth as he settled back and reached for his cup. I've seen to it, he added lightly, that their uneasiness increases and that they too remember that miracle. I'll wager you have, thought Mara. So that was the story. It all but took her breath away. This was no palace intrigue, but a revolution involving priesthood, nobility, and the populace. No doubt the army as well. And the whole complex affair was cupped in the palm of this prince of schemers beside her. She studied him, half in fear, half in admiration, as he drank his wine. Hatshepsut held Thutmose, fast prisoner, but no one stood higher in her trust than the smooth-tongued Lord Sheftu, the most dangerous man to her in all Egypt. How had he accomplished it? Shrewd foresight, patience, deceit, so sustained and perfect, it was a work of art. I am masterpiece, thought Mara, remembering his airy disregard of court etiquette yesterday, his lounging arrogance. Yet there was a far different chef to the dark and lonely figure she had seen silhouetted against the flaming sky one evening on the beetle. She felt close to him suddenly. For all his innocence, insouciance, for all his gold, he lived a life as precarious as her own. And if he obeyed those terrible instructions, she must give, uh, she must give him tonight. As he set down his cup, she turned away, pushing the thought hastily from her mind. No need to think of those instructions yet, the ones to go and to rob the pharaoh rob the dead. No need to think of them at all. Remember, Mara, he is your enemy. And have you not bested him as his, at his own game tonight? Take heart, though. He conceals it better. He's no more inhuman to you than Rashid. His first words served to verify her confidence. What is it about thee, maid, that loosens my tongue at both ends? By the beard of Ta, I've done more talking tonight than... Do you not talk to others so? Nay, I do not. He sounded annoyed to her mischievous delight. She quoted blandly from an ancient proverb, Be not arrogant because of thy knowledge. Goodly discourse is more hidden than the precious green stone, and yet it is found with slave girls over the millstones. Silence, he quoted back at her dryly, is more valuable than the teft-teft plant. See that you watch your own tongue. Scarce uh, a handful even know who I am, and it is better that they, they do not. Oh, a few know the plans, of course. Now for the goldsmith, the priest, 
I was talking to when you arrived, Ash, or a few nobles, Nakonk, and I, reminded Mara. I, and now you, he had learned, or I'm sorry, he had leaned forward, his profile half hidden from her by the bulk of his shoulder, and he was toying with one of his reed pins, turning it over and over in his long brown fingers. I'll wager I live to regret that, he added. Mara pressed close to him. Sashai, do you not trust me? He turned with a half smile and glance, and a glance from his long eyes that made her heart beat faster. My lovely Mara, he said softly, I don't trust you as far as tomorrow. She jerked away, her confidence suddenly in tatters. I, so you have said before, if it is true, you have great faith in the gods. Nay, I have great faith in your reluctance to go back to loaf snatching. He was laughing at her now. All in an instant, he had retreated behind that facade of charming banter where neither thrust nor wiles could reach him. Furious, she struggled for a manner as careless. How had she ever imagined she felt close to this enigma? He had only made a fool of her. Or had he really opened his mind to her in a moment of earnestness and then regretted it? One thing was certain. He wished to remind her, and perhaps himself, of their precise relationship. Loaf snatching, gutter snipe. Very well, so be it. She had, her, she had herself in hand by the time he spoke again. Never mind that. Let us say you are one of the gambles I've dared to take. So far, it's not but exhilarating. Now tell me, how did you swindle your way through those gates tonight? She shrugged. With a languishing glance and a few tears, there's a young sentry who thinks I'm smitten with him. A handsome young sentry, she said, she added. Indeed, how pleasant for you. But did tears alone convince him he should let you through the gates? He would much rather have kissed me, but I consented to a bargain. Oh, very good. And you will dangle this bargain like a sweet meat until the fellow has served his purpose. Excellent. It might last for months. And again, it mightn't, retorted Mara sharply. The conversation was go not going as she wished. Even a sentry's patience may be tried too far, you know. This one's young and ardent. What if, he, what if his patience ends? Sheftu eased one elbow onto the table, rested his cheek in his hand, and regarded her blandly. His long eyes were brimming with amusement. He'll think of something, he said. Oh, the devil take you, Mara thought. Aloud, she snapped, or perhaps I shall simply keep the bargain. There was a little silence. Sheftu straightened, took a sip of his wine, and set the mug down with care. Not, he said unless you wish me to feed him to the crocodiles bit by bit. Mara's mouth dropped open, but before she could speak, another voice, soft and persuasive, as the flute's tone slid between them. He just said that if, if she does keep the bargain and kiss Rashed, that he, Sheftu, will feed Rashed bit by bit to the crocodiles. I think he just admitted that he would be jealous if... That happened. Ah, so now we're getting somewhere. So now there's a new voice in here. A lover's quarrel, friend Sashai. It was the juggler standing in the entrance to their cubicle. He had a crooked shoulder, shoulder Mara noticed, and a smile of curious charm in a twisted, ugly face. His glittering balls were momentarily at rest in the curve of his arm, save for three which traced a shining, stealthy little circle above his right hand, as if they had a life of their own. Nay, Saur, answered Chef too easily. We never quarrel, nor are we in love. The first was a lie, thought Mara, but the second? She was still tingling with surprise over the remark about Rashed and the crocodiles. Glancing impatiently at Saur, uh, she found her gaze caught and held by a pair of dark, cynical eyes, profoundly old, profoundly weary, as if they had long ago seen everything and found value in nothing. And may I know this enchanting stranger whom you claim you do not love? 
went on the juggler. If you speak truth, friend Sashai, then your heart must be a mysterious thing, no more flesh and blood than one of my gilded balls here. It is, is it not so, blue-eyed one? I know not, juggler, mur uh, murmured Mara. She was half attracted, half repelled by this Saur with his young, beguiling voice and his old, old eyes. Nay, call me not juggler, but friend, my heart is no gilded plaything. The balls rose in a golden fountain above his hand, then resumed their steady circling, but his gaze never left Mara's face. Have you orders for me, master? Not tonight. I'm desolate. Would there uh, were a cause for me to linger in the light of this little one's countenance? Where did you say you discovered her? I failed to say, answered Sheftu dryly. Sheftu's, uh, I'm sorry, Saur's smile curved beneath his ancient eyes. Aye, so you did. But she is not of Thebes, for I have seen high and low princesses and slaves, and who could forget her? She was not among them. Mother Nile has borne her to us from another shore, no doubt, as she bears the gifts of mud, which makes Egypt great. Will you permit my poor efforts to entertain you, face of the lily? Sheftu shook his head. Be gone, Saur, others crave your talents. While you crave to mend the quarrel, which was not a quarrel, with this lovely one who is not beloved. The three balls leaped up, dazzling, and with a subtle twist of his body, Saur brought all the others into play. In that case, I shall leave you, flower of grace, though not forever. May thy caw endure, and thy shadow seek the light. The soft voice trailed away as he turned, letting his gaze slide off Mara at last. The golden cataract of balls switched suddenly to a triangle, then to a pattern of brilliant intricacy before resolving once more into a circle. In a frame of moving light, the juggler glided away across the floor. Mother of the gods, breathed Mara. Is he man or keft? Sheftu laughed. Sour dwells in a dark land, I grant you, but there is no harm in him. I found him very useful. You mean you trust him with your secrets? Great Ammon, he'd betray his own Ka, I believe. Nay, he is loyal. In any case, he knows little, not even who I am. I admit he tries his best to find out. It's just curiosity. Remember, Saur. Perhaps, muttered Mara, she frowned. This talk of loyalty and betrayal had made her aware of much she had forgotten and would rather have gone on forgetting. She twirled her wine mug, watching the playful uh, the play of golden balls on the other side of the room. Why had the juggler tried so hard to discover where she came from and who she was? Already, in his poetic babbling of Mother Nile, he had arrived at one answer very shrewdly, and his cynical eyes had never moved from her. He would know her next time they met. That was certain. Where would it be? Perhaps in the presence of Lord Nahira? Remember, Lord here is her other master that works for the Queen Hatshepsut. She shivered and took a sip of the wine, trying to dismiss the notion as impossible. But her thoughts were restless now, leaping back to that message she had yet to deliver. It was warm and pleasant here with the good smell of meat and the, torch lit, uh, the torchlight flooding the room with smoky gold. But outside the night was waning. There was still the river to cross, the dark alleys and the silent streets to find her way through, uh, the stealthy uh, taps on Rashed's gate. She set down her cup and spoke in a low voice. It grows, it grows late, Sashai. I must leave. And before that, before that, you must tell me what I must know. I, it is time made, but not here. He added with a glance at the trio of Libyan traders, noisily taking possession of the next cubicle come. He rose and drew her to her feet. Picking up her cloak, she followed him out across the room. We, uh, we were all, we were, sorry, we are really enemies, she reminded herself. I care not for what happens to him. 
Nikonk stood up as they pre- uh, passed by him, detached himself from his companions, and drifted toward the door. Otherwise, no notice was taken of them. The two old men were setting up their board for another game of hounds and jackals. Asher was hurrying toward the priest's table with a steaming platter. The dancing girl was passing her tambourine among a group of hilarious artisans in the corner. As they reached the fire pan where the innkeeper's wife was um, was dishing up more meat, Chef Tu paused and spoke quietly. Miftaya. She straightened. Chef Tu handed her a few debon like any man paying for his wine. This maid is one of us, he murmured. She is free to come and go here any time. The old woman's eyes moved to Mara's. She nodded grudgingly, then slipped. Sorry. Then slipped the coins onto her money ring and turned back to the fire. In a moment, Shefty was holding open the tavern's outer door. The moon had risen now, a faded sliver in the vast dark sky, and the night had grown chill. Mara wrapped her cloak around her as she followed Shefty into the darkest corner of the courtyard. Yonder by the gate was a dim hulk, which must be, ne- which must be Nakonk. Now, tell me, Shefty had lowered his voice almost to nothing. Was my pharaoh well? I, you gave him my message. I, I gave it. Well, go on. What did he say? She roused herself, trying to shake off a feeling of oppression. He seemed overjoyed. He said, you must be the great magician himself. She could feel Sheftu's deep pleasure. The gods were with me on that venture. I've not been idle since. When you see him next, say to him that two of the uncertain ones, he of the fan and he of the feather, have come into our house. Do you have that clear? He of the fan and he of the feather, echoed Mara mechanically. I, I have it. Good. Now, for my orders. As she hesitated, he frowned impatiently. Come, speak. We have not, we not, we have not all night. He says you must find more gold. I I know that. I've promised bribes already. I cannot pay. But where? Did he? What's amiss, maid? Sheftu bent closer, scanning her face. Then he slowly straightened. Is it bad, then? Aye, it is bad. It is so dread a thing, I dare not speak it. Aye, I beg thee, Sheftu, disobey this time. Thy prince has no right to demand such a crime of thee, no matter. Hush! He clapped a hand over her mouth, darting an angry glance about the courtyard. Would you have all thieves here? Now cease thy babbling and tell me. Nay, I'll not. Do not ask me, Sheftu, it is better thus. I vow it is better. You should never. He swept her forcibly against him, doubling her wrist behind her in a grip that made her wince. You forget yourself, he said in a low, harsh voice. You are not judge, but messenger. Tell me what Pharaoh commands. Be quick. Wait, I will, but loose me. I. A slight wrench on her wrist turned the plea into a gasp of pain. She uh, tumbled the words out. He asks if your magic be a shield and a buckler to you. Ammon help you. You must rob the dead. Go on. He said There is one alone in all of Egypt who will give gold gladly for his sake. You must find this one by the dark river. You must take what is his, even to the royal cobra and the collar of amulets. Ay, mother of the gods, loose me, Sheftu. This is all? Ay, I swear. All. The pressure on her wrist eased. She leaned against him, trying to steady her breathing. After a time, his arms dropped, and he moved a few steps away. But then, or but when he spoke at last, it was in his usual ironic voice. Must I always drag my message out of you by brute force? It promises to be wearying. She raised her head. In the dim moonlight, his features were composed, if a trifle set. You are not disturbed by this one? It was not entirely unexpected. I see, she breathed. Then you intend to obey, blue-eyed one. That is none of your affair. 
But she knew the answer. You're a fool, she whispered. Ten thousand kinds of a fool to risk your soul among the kefs. They'll steal away your caw and leave you naught but the shell of you. They'll dwell in your shadow. They'll bring you down to blindness and sickness. They'll deliver you to the forty beasts. Her voice cracked and she broke off. You tell me nothing I do not know, said Chef Du softly. Say one thing. Why are you so troubled about my fate? I, she stopped and drew a long breath. I, I am not troubled. You are close to tears. So remember when he said he'll feed Rashed to the crocodiles? Now she, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. And it's going, why do you care so much? They both are letting out, you know, their secret love for each other in a way. Mara turned away from him, rubbing her sore wrist. Not I. If you cho choose to be a reckless fool, it's not to me. As she, he said nothing, she whirled back defensively. I speak truth, do you? I, I do. He pulled her back into his arms. Quite differently this time. You never spoke truth in your life, he muttered. But speak it now. Why do you weep for me? Mara's heart was beating fast. He was going to kiss her. It was inevitable this time. Perhaps for the same reason you threatened to feed my poor Rashed to the crocodiles, she whispered. She waited, scarcely breathing. Chef Tu, were you afraid I might keep that bargain? He, his arms loosened suddenly, and the old, faintly mocking amusement returned to his voice. Nay, I was afraid you might lose your entry in and out of the palace he said lightly. Aye, aye, what a lovely hussy you are. This poor Rashed, I pity him. What will become of his illusions when he finds you out? Mara jerked away furious. Only what should have become of them. He must learn sometimes not to believe every maid who weeps on his shoulder. Aye, so he must, agreed Shefty dryly. Now go, the conch is waiting. Without further fa farewell, he turned and strode rapidly toward the inn. Okay, there was a lot going on there. Um, they definitely like each other. They definitely don't trust each other. They're definitely worried about each other. They definitely know that this shouldn't happen. Um, it's crazy. Crazy world, isn't it? All right. Well, anyway, that's it for now. You guys have a great day. I will see you tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye.